Here in the small holding, we try and be as self-sufficient as possible in fruit and vegetable production. This is one of our currant beds. We've got black currants, white currants, and red currants. But as you can see, these plants are bursting out of their protective neck covering. We need a bigger fruit cage, but fruit cages are expensive. Let us show you what we did to come up with a low cost solution. Welcome to English Country Life, my name's Fiona. In terms of growing our own food, fruit tops the bill. And that's because if we're going to reduce our food bills, fruit's incredibly expensive to buy, both in season and even more expensive out of season. If we can grow as much of our own fruit as possible and then preserve it either through drying or freezing, we can enjoy it all year round. Currants are some of the fruits we really love to eat. And we have black currants, red currants, and white currants. And at the moment, we've got them housed in these quite low frames. And the currant bushes have outgrown them tremendously. We need to protect them from birds who want to eat the currants. But we've got debris netting on here and that also prevents some insects getting in. And actually, we don't need that level of protection. We're at a point where not only have these plants outgrown the height, but the netting has degraded significantly. So you can see we've repaired it here and sewn big holes back together. So the whole thing really needs to be replaced. The ideal scenario for us is to have a walk-in fruit cage. And I'll show you the commercial fruit cage we have for our raspberries and blackberries, but they're expensive. We're smallholders and to reduce our bills this year, we've been looking around for a low cost solution. And we have one here on site and I'm going to take you through the whole process for us to create that walk in structure. Now, if you don't have the ability to duplicate the structure that we've got with what you have on site, the frames which we're going to use are still very, very cheap to buy relatively. And there's a link in our Amazon store if you choose to go down this route. So you can duplicate it at a fairly low cost. But let's get started and I'll talk you through the whole process. This is our commercial fruit cage and it is huge, but it was also very expensive. Now over the years, it's paid for itself multiple times over. It houses our raspberries and blackberries. And with the amount of fruit we've retrieved and eaten, we have paid for this fruit cage multiple times over, but it's still a huge investment right at the beginning to install it. And right now we don't want to be spending that kind of money. We are getting into this mindset of the smallholder of recycle, reuse, repurpose. So we've come up with an alternative. And this is our alternative. These are actually polytunnel frames. And at the moment, they're housing our chickens. At the time of filming, we're subject to an avian influenza prevention zone here in the UK. And that legally requires us to either keep the chickens indoors or in a fully netted enclosure. So this is what we've done. And it's covered in bird netting, which is perfect for what we want, and debris netting over the top. What we actually need is a three metre wide section by eight meters long. The polytunnel frames are three meters wide, so perfect width, but they are six meters long. However, they're a modular structure and they come in one meter widths. So we can easily combine two different polytunnels, bring them together and create three meters wide by eight meters long. All we need now is to get the area prepared down the field and to have the restrictions lifted for the chickens. But let me show you the preparations. Our plan is very simple. Today we've got two beds of currants and side to side they're four and a half metres wide, which is too wide for our polytunnel frame, which is only three metres wide. So that means one of these rows has to be moved. We're going to move this row to the far side of this bed and retain this bed exactly where it is. And there's two reasons for that. The first is that we've got an unused vegetable bed at the far side of this bed of currants, which actually means that it's less disturbance to all of the plants. The second thing is that unused bed is the bottom of our vegetable plot. So it still keeps things nice and neat because we are going to have to cut that bed essentially 
literally straight down the middle. So even if we do that, because it's at the end, it doesn't look out of place. We are in winter and this is one of the best times to move plants. You're likely to cause the least harm to the plant by digging it up and shifting it to a new location because it's not in active growth. So I need to get on and move everything before these plants all wake up. Now that is going to be before our polytunnel frames are going to be available for us to use, but we'll be ready to roll long before the fruits actually start to form on the plants. This is the vegetable bed that's going to be sacrificed. Essentially what we're going to do is cut it straight down the middle. The far side will sit outside the polytunnel structure and this side will sit inside the polytunnel structure. We've got raised sides to the bed at the moment and these boards are actually in very good condition, which can't be said for some of the boards surrounding the beds further down the field. So I'm going to dismantle these and use these to repair those which are a little bit worse for wear. We do have a grass path as well between the beds as it stands today and I'm going to take one half to re-turf the side of this bed which is outside the polytunnel. The remaining turf I'm going to use to repair the chicken field. It saves me a job of reseeding and if I've got this turf available of course I'm going to use it. The currents have outgrown their existing cage structures and that's what I'm going to take apart first. But I'm going to fast forward through the whole process and start by taking the netting off because it takes more time than you might imagine. The next job is to remove the plumber's pipe which is draped over the top of the goalpost arrangements to form the cage structure. They're held in place with pipe clamps which need to be unscrewed before the pipes can be taken off. Finally, the last part of the cage can be removed and I can lift the goalposts out and take them away for storage. The low cage structures and the nets over the currents have now been dismantled. So what I need to do is start on this vegetable bed and that means removing these high sides so that we can incorporate half of this vegetable bed into the new polytunnel frame. The planks which make up the high sides are secured by screws to staves which go deep into the ground. All I need to do is reverse the screws out and then I can remove the planks. I'm going to salvage as many of the planks as I possibly can so I can reuse them elsewhere in the vegetable plot for ongoing repairs. So for now I'm going to store them in our compost area. My next job is to remove the grass path between the two original vegetable beds. Half of the grass path will be used to turf the half of the vegetable bed closest to the camera. The final fruit cage arrangement needs to be three meters wide. So before I start digging out the grass and turfing areas, I'm going to measure that three meters width and I'll put a string in place so I know approximately where the grass needs to go. Now I can start digging. I'm using a spade to cut sections of lawn piece by piece. It would be far more precise if I had a turf cutter. This would mean that I would make sure the turf was removed at a uniform depth and it would make it easier to create a flat surface when I lay the turf in its new location. The reality is that this isn't a perfect garden lawn. It's a field on a small holding, so I'm sacrificing precision in favour of saving money by not hiring a turf cutter. It does mean that I'll have to take a little bit more time in laying the turf, but that's okay. I'm now part way through the project and I've dug half the grass out and I've stored that turf over the far side. And that's because I'm going to use it to re-turf the other side of this orange string in the old vegetable bed. Now the difference in height between the soil in the old vegetable bed and the turf that I've dug out is actually quite significant. But it's okay, it's not a problem because as I remove that earth to get it at the right height for the turf to go in, I'm going to use it to fill this trench. Now the ideal scenario would be that I would dig the old currant bushes out and move it into this trench as I move the soil. But what I've decided to do is to continue to move the project this way. So the next thing I'm going to do is take the boards off this fruit bed at the moment so that I can then easily remove this grass and I'm going to transfer this grass into the old chicken enclosure. 
I've removed the high sided boards around the current bed in exactly the same way as before and I've kept any good quality boards to repair those vegetable beds further down the field. I can start digging out the turf but this time I'm lifting it into a wheelbarrow to make it easier to transport to the chicken field. Although the field is grassed, the chickens do still dig holes and this turf will be perfect to fill in those patches. The next stage is the purpose of the entire exercise, which is to move the current bushes. To give the plants the best chance of survival, they need to be pruned back hard. Now this is because when I dig them out, I'll try to keep as many of their roots as possible, but they will lose a significant amount nonetheless. If the remaining roots have less top growth to support, the plant has the best chance of survival. Digging the bushes out is hard work because I need a wide circle to keep the roots and a deep dig so that any roots that have reached deep into the ground can be kept. I tried to take my time as much as possible as I'd spent a lot of time digging out the turf to help us keep these current plants so this job isn't the time to rush. You'll notice that I haven't weeded below the current bushes before I started digging. That's because it's easier to remove the weeds when the soil is loosened as I dig. The plants can be put into their new location and I don't even need to dig a trench for them as the soil height is already significantly lower by digging the turf out. I'm using the soil from the area that will be re-turfed to fill the space around the current plants. Hopefully, and I do have my fingers crossed, this means that the turf that I've dug out will neatly fit into its new location. Once I've got the current plants with enough soil around them, I'm treading the soil in to make sure that it's firm around the roots. To give the turf the best chance of remaining viable once it's in place, I need to make sure that it's lying on soil that it can easily knit with. I'm not adding any fertiliser or compost as the soil is already very healthy and nutritious, but I am going to rake it over to remove any large lumps and create a nice smooth tilt where the grass can put its root into without any issues. Once that's complete, I can lay each section of grass on top, trying to create a flat surface. As I mentioned before, I'm not being too precise with this. As long as it's roughly even, that's good enough in this field. I'm rubbing soil into the joints between the turf patches, as well as stamping each section into place. And that's all in the hope of removing any air pockets, which will help the turf to survive. Once all the turf patches are in place, I half walk, half shuffle down the sections to even out any lumps and bumps that I find. This is the last job that needs doing before I move on to feeding and watering. I'm so happy to say that the heaviest work, all of that digging is now complete, but I've got a couple of small jobs I need to do before I can take a proper break. And the first one is to give these currant bushes a good dressing of a fertilizer. And we like this all purpose fish blood and bone because it is organic. The second thing that we're going to do is to water them in thoroughly, which means that the currant bushes have got the best chance for survival. And I'll keep watering them every day for roughly about a week just to be sure that they're properly settled in. Applying the fertilizer is really easy. It just needs to be sprinkled liberally around every single fruit plant and then watered in well. It's been a race against time to get the current bushes in place before they started to grow. And as you can see, they're sprouting beautifully. And it's been about three weeks since I did all of the digging. So I'm really pleased that they've taken so beautifully. I've also applied a wood shaving mulch underneath each of the plants, which should help them thrive even more by retaining moisture in the ground. What I need to do now is move on to stage two. 
Part two is going to be all about putting the fruit cage structure in place to protect those current bushes I've spent so much time digging into place. As you can see, the avian influenza restrictions have now been lifted in the UK and the chickens are back free ranging in their field, which is such a relief to us. And it means that their fully netted enclosure that we had them living in for about four months is now free to be dismantled, taken down the field and become that cheap fruit cage. So join us next Next week we'll go through that process and you can see the job being finished. If you have liked this content, take a moment and give me a thumbs up below. If you're not already a subscriber, hit subscribe and the bell icon, you'll get to know of every new video as soon as it's published, including part two in this short series. If you've got any questions for us, or if you've got an idea for another video you'd like, to, like us to make, leave it in the comments section and we'll do our best to answer your queries as soon as possible, or even make that other video for you. But for now, thanks for watching. Don't forget to join us next week and we look forward to seeing you next time.